Methodist. Good morning, Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Boy, it's uh, once again, it's great to to be in this space together. Uh, it is uh, it's awesome to uh, to worship together. As nice as it's been over the last several weeks to uh, to worship in our homes, um, uh, there is something that is that is missed from. Uh, being able to encourage one another and, uh, and be present here. Um, I want to share with you this morning uh, is a call to worship from uh, the 89th Psalm. And it says, uh, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I'll make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. So it, uh, that serves as a reminder uh, to me anyway that uh, in heaven it is nonstop worship and praise to God. Uh, and so when we get to be together um, like this, multiple, multiple families together, it gives us just a, a little taste for this moment, for this time uh, of what heaven is like uh, and of what is going on uh, in heaven. So um, I hope that uh, that, that image, uh, that reminder for each of you, uh, kind of encourages you to uh, to engage in uh, in singing uh, songs of praise to Him uh, in a more uh, more meaningful, passionate fashion than maybe what you were feeling on this humid morning uh, as you walked in today. Uh, but would you pray with me, Almighty God? It takes just a moment to stop and uh, consider your presence in our lives to uh, really to bring us into a state of, of worship and adoration and praise. Lord, we know that um, on, on this day being your day and this time set aside to worship you, uh, that... Um, we have opportunity to do so in a unique fashion. We also know this morning, Lord, that um, uh, for, uh, for many of us, uh, this being Father's Day, um, our dads are, uh, are absent from this earth, uh, uh, but present with you. Uh, and so to have your reminder, uh, the reminder from your word that that they are worshiping in this time as well um, is special, uh, and there's a sweetness about it. So, Lord, we pray this morning that, uh, that all distractions would fall away uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, we pray this morning, Lord, that um, uh, as we uh, proclaim through song, uh, and as we listen uh, with open ears, open mind, open heart, that our spirit would just perpetually glorify you um, and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to pray before uh, Doug's going to come. He's going to share a scripture with us, but I want to pray. Uh, Father, I think about... Uh, the message of these two songs. First of all, my confidence is in you because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, we come uh, and we gather in worship and you give us the right perspective. Lord, because the truth is sometimes we look around at situations and, and, and what's happening and we hear things and we witness things and see things and sometimes we're part of it. And I'm reminded that my confidence is not in any of man's solutions, but it's only in you. And in the midst of the storms of this life, you are doing more than we know. And you are working. And uh, you are drawing people to you. So, Lord, we pray this and we 
we declare this knowing that these things are true, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You, may, you can be seated, and Doug's going to come and share a scripture with us. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> I'm going to read out of Luke chapter 6 this morning, starting with verse 12, if you want to follow along. One of these days, another translation better puts it shortly after this, Jesus went up on the mountainside to pray, spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who's called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, this is the same message we see in Matthew, blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer before the sermon. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everyone who has uh, been able to get out this morning. Um, I pray that our hearts will be enriched and we will, you will just draw us close to you. You will, um, and we will respond um, and respond quickly. And, um, I just pray for that sense of your spirit um, talking to us. Pray for Pastor Phil as he gives a message. Um, and I pray that it would speak to each one of our hearts. And we would take, take home something that we can um, chew on and live by this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, CB. So as I was uh, preparing for this week, I pulled out my notes. And, uh, and I pulled up my computer and I looked at the last time I preached, it was three months ago today, that I was able to bring the word to you guys um, from this place. And a lot's happened in that time. And, uh, and I have found in that time that, uh, that God's love really is sufficient, you know. Um, and I want to thank Pastor Steve. Pastor Steve continues to provide good leadership along with Michelle and our leadership team, our delegates, our board, uh, Sunday school teachers. Uh, you guys have been awesome. And uh, you continue to be awesome. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm still uh, processing things through and, and Jesse and I are, are learning about a new normal and, uh, and so I'm still leaning very, very heavily on Pastor Steve and will be for a while, but I'm going to be... Uh, popping up from time to time this summer and preaching more and more. So that's just the way it is. Um, so I want to show you a picture from just uh, two, two weeks ago, Sunday before last. And uh, that's a, a picture and, uh, of, of myself and Jesse and Caleb and my daughter-in-law, Lindsay. And uh, we, we stopped... Um, in Southern Indiana, we were, we were visiting some friends in Southern Indiana, and, uh, and Lindsay and Caleb were with us. We took a road trip together. We haven't had a road trip now since our new family dynamics, so we took this road trip to Southern Indiana, and, um, 
and it was a good trip to take. And in that trip, I found that my family is forever blessed by the godly impression that my bride has left. And believe it or not, it was a joyous time. You see, we went to Sardin, Indiana, because Bedford, Indiana is an important chapter in the life of, of our family. In uh, early 1996, in February of 1996, um, a dream that we had and a calling that we had had to go into full-time ministry was fulfilled. And that's where it began. And so from time to time, we, we would go back and visit because I think about it this way. In our life, we have, we have chapters, right? Ever read a really good novel and uh, you get stuck? Sometimes you're in a chapter in a novel and it's a really good chapter and you, you kind of camp out there for a minute and you reread parts of it. At least I do. And then... then um, then that chapter changes. And sometimes when you go to a new chapter, there are characters that you're introduced to in one chapter that don't show up again for a long time. You see, so our time, our calling at our first appointment in Bedford is, has been like that for us. It was an important chapter in our life. And from time to time, we go back and visit. We have some lifelong friends that we will have until we go to the grave uh, that live there, and we always stay with them. And as we're there... Um, we're always able to, to meet some people that we were able to invest in and, uh, and see how God's truth was implanted in their hearts and in their life. So during my time there and our time there, I was uh, reflecting and I was praising God for lives changed and for how you can celebrate that part. And it was a reminder for me that, uh, that now after coming through a storm and a trial, I'm turning the page on a new chapter. And so are we, church. Okay? The things going on with COVID, with racial tensions, all these things happening in our world today. Church, we're at a place where we're turning the page on a new chapter. And you know what we will find there? That God is still God. And that he is faithful. And that God has more than we, we can ever imagine. And there's joy on the other side. And there's joy in the next chapter. And we will see that. I believe that. So now my family and I, and we as a church, we're, we find ourselves in this new place. And it's not a bad place. This picture is, um, you can't see it very well on the screen, but... Um, it's, it's near uh, Washington, Indiana, which is in southern Indiana, so um, pretty far south. Uh, far enough where if you ask people where the jug, it's called the jug rock. It's a weird rock formation that kind of looks like, I guess it's supposed to look like a big jug on top of the spiral. I, to me, it just looks like a big rock. But, um, but people stop and they always get their, they walk down and they get their picture taken there and, and if you go to that part of Indiana and you ask them how to get to the Jug Rock or you ask them about where something is or where Washington is, they will say, oh, you mean Washington. If you live there, you have to put an R in it, Washington. That's the official pronunciation if you're in Southern Indiana. Um, I give them a hard time when I'm there, but they don't understand. But it's fitting that we were in front of that rock. I thought about that with the new family dynamic. And I say with God, there's always more. With God, there is always more. Because when Jesus is the rock of your life, there is always more. It's a sure foundation. And I want us to think about that as we move forward and as we think about this message. Let's pray together. Father, uh, today I want to break the word of God in a correct manner. And... Um, Lord, you know the desire of my heart is to be very direct. Father, I believe that you have called and, and uh, impressed upon me to share things that are hard for me to read and hear. And they may be for all of us. But Lord, I'm reminded as we celebrate uh, Father's Day that you are the perfect Father and I have fallen far short but I have found that you are faithful. And Lord, the best way for me uh, to be direct is to rely on your word. So Lord, help us today to respond and listen, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This morning, if you are taking notes, I'm going to give you uh, some things to write down, about uh, three things exactly to write down. If you hadn't planned on taking notes, now is a good time to plan on taking notes. Um, find a, a piece of paper or something, or pull up your, you know, almost every phone has this little thing in it called simple notepad or something like that. Pull it up, a little keyboard comes up, and you can type these things in your phone. And I learned something important about that feature. You have to push that little save button thing. But even if you don't push the save button thing, once you go through the practice of putting those notes down, you're going to remember them anyway. So I've learned that too. Um, but I want you, I have uh, two sentences I want you to finish. I want you to write these sentences down or embed them in your memory somehow or go back and listen to the message later. I want you to think about these sentences. And I don't want you necessarily to answer them right now, but I want you to begin the process of thinking about them right now. And then the third one is a question that I want you to answer. And I want you to determine, to determine to respond to these things in an honest, authentic way between you and God. When you hear these, these, uh, these two sentences and this question, our tendency is this, to want to answer them with, with the answers we want to hear. And just look at it quickly and give the, the answer that makes me uh, feel better about where I'm at. But I want us to wrestle through and want us to be honest and authentic with ourselves. I want you to think deeply and to respond during this week while you spend time talking with Father God, asking him to search your heart. So the first sentence I want you to finish this week is this. My relationship with God can be described this way. My relationship with God can be described as... The second one I want you to think about is this. My relationship with family members and those closest to me can be described as. My relationship with family members and those closest to me can be described as. And third, this question. I want you to think about how to answer this. How do I relate to others? I mean, how do I really relate to others? Acquaintances, those whom I only know casually, those whom I just, I only see at work or see in passing. And it's a two-part question. Do I value them as loved by God? I want you to hear me this morning that um, I've come to understand uh, how much I love this church family. I've come to, to deeply understand that. I want you to know that I have a, a deep love for our community. And it is my love for God which compels me to call you to do an authentic soul searching. I know this more than ever. My relationship with God has to change every relationship I have with other people. It has to. My relationship with God has to change how I see others. My relationship with God has to change how I respond to people who oppose me. Do you know it's possible to disagree with someone on virtually everything? Their philosophy of life, the way they view every political decision, every, it's, a, it's possible to disagree with them on everything and still love them. Here's something I'm learning. It's possible to disagree with someone and not want to call them a name. I'm working on that. So, um, in our gospel message this morning, we, uh, we heard that Jesus began teaching and brought this message that begins with what we know as the Beatitudes, and then there's more, more preaching and teaching that surrounds that. And Jesus brought this message. So, uh, sometimes we want to think that this is the first message Jesus preached. It is not. This is about a year and a half into his ministry. 
Jesus preached this after he had called Levi, who became known as Matthew. And Luke tells us that Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. Then he called out 12 of his disciples that he appointed into a leadership position as apostles. And he begins to teach them. So in the crowd, everybody, there's, there's all kinds of people in the crowd. Some are interested in wanting to find out who Jesus is, what he's about. There have been healings and things happening, but there are those there who are committed disciples, and there are those there who have just been appointed as leaders. And Jesus begins to talk to them. And he says these incredible things, like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Or we may say it this way, blessed are those who know that they are in desperate need of God in for everything. I can't do anything apart from the Lord God. He gives us this incredible teaching and he continues to expound on it. And Matthew gives us these detailed notes as to what Jesus said and how he continued to, to teach. And Matthew kind of takes the teaching after the Beatitudes, Matthew takes all this teaching and he kind of bookends it between two things. First of all, he says in Matthew 5.13, Matthew records for us that Jesus said this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And later on, just a couple chapters later, as Jesus, Matthew records all these things and gives us all these great sermon notes, really, that we can glean from. Then in chapter 7, Matthew records this, that Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And Jesus talks about that there are two, two ways to build. There's a way to build that where the foundation is shallow and on sand and, and not stable, or there's a way to build where your foundation is the rock of Christ. And so between all of this, Jesus gives us this picture that it's important that we care for the condition of our soul. This is your, your salt and light. In Jesus' day, for salt to be good, you had to care for it. You had to keep it in a dry place if it was going to preserve and do what it was intended to do, if it was going to bring out flavor. Otherwise, it would, be, it would all clump together, and all you would be able to use it for would be uh, to kind of like smooth out a path. So Jesus says, care for your soul. The same is true for light. If you had an oil lamp, an oil lamp can only give off light if it has oil in it and if the wick is trimmed and if you care for it. So he says, care for your soul. Care for your condition. And as you care, you'll be able to bring out things that are of God. The message translates this passage as God flavors and God colors, right? So as I love God and and, and I become aware of God's love for me, it will change every relationship I have with others. So we have this happening and Jesus is teaching and he calls them, he looks at them. Remember, he is calling them out as as leaders. He's appointed them leaders and he's looking right at them. The Bible says he looks at them. He says, I want you to care for your condition, the condition of your soul and to nurture it because you you will help people see and know what it means to follow me. And it's true for all of us. This message is true for us today. And we need to pay attention to it as if Jesus is giving it to us today because he is. So Matthew gives us all these details and he continues to, to unpack a lot of things that, that Jesus says for us. And, and as we continue to read this, um, I become aware that this is a difficult message. And I read this and I want to modify it. Because Jesus says some hard things. And as I read it, I'm reminded that um, being a follower of Jesus is not about checking off a list of accomplishments and how well I obey the law. 
We can't obey the law very good, can we? I mean, we, uh, think about the COVID thing. You ever tried to go grocery shopping? You, you have, right? I could not obey those laws. I violated the traffic flow I don't know how many times. They, they got those arrows. And, and that X thing, you ever try to jump from X to X? It's hard to do. So all the time, I'm asking, for, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeking forgiveness, you know, in the store. But we, but we read, well, what, what are we trying to do? We're, we're trying to exercise care because we're concerned for people's health and safety. So we try to, we try to do things that, uh, we try to understand the spirit of what's happening. Jesus is giving us the thing. We read this in, in this passage and we find out that this is more than me checking off a list or seeking to be, uh, live within some kind of parameters, it's much, much more than that. Jesus didn't come uh, to abolish the law. He came to establish something even greater. He came bringing forgiveness of sins and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Pastor Steve has been leading us through a series and is going to continue to uh, lead us through the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is talking about being emptied of myself and what I think I want and what I need, but being filled with God's Holy Spirit in his very presence, working in me, understanding that God's plan is for God's glory to be evident in my life. God's plan is for his glory to be evident in your life. So Jesus teaches these things that are, that are difficult. So look at 5, verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. These are hard things for us to hear, and when I read them, I want to modify them. Jesus starts off and he says something that we're all in agreement on. He says, murder is the ultimate devaluation of human life. You've heard it said, do not murder. Yeah. And Jesus isn't minimizing murder. He's not, he's not saying that at all. But he's saying, you understand that murder is wrong and an abomination. But I tell you, the law is more than just not murdering. I'm telling you, I'm talking to you about the spirit of the law. And so Jesus begins to say, look at your brother, look at your sister, and love them. See them as someone who is created and given life by God. Value them. He says to him, don't say raka. You'll have to explain and give an account of what you said. Someone's going to be, they'll be offended by that. They'll, they'll, give you, they'll call you out on it. Don't call another a fool. These attitudes work in the heart of the follower of Christ and act as a spiritual cancer. In fact, so much so that it can cause separation from God. I was reflecting a bit on, these, on the, this teaching from Jesus and that Matthew has for us here in and the, there's no one word that can be used to describe Raka. Like, I never looked at anyone that I was mad at and said, Raka. <laughs> you probably have to use like a glutter, like a Hebrew, Raka. Like, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I don't know. But there's no direct translation for it because um, it's a word that, exp any word that expresses contempt that's, that downgrades another's intelligence fits that description. 
And we can find all kinds of examples of that. Um, we often speak these words in places where people can't hear them. If they did hear us say them, they would call us on it. It goes against the calling of the follower of Jesus to speak of this way of someone. So I had been thinking about these, and I was going over this Friday. On Friday early evening, Jesse and I took a little road trip to Midland. And as we're going, this person was not paying attention to what was happening in traffic around them. And, and there were two cars coming at me. It, went, it was a weird thing that was happening. And I went, well, that's not good. Someone needs to pay attention here. So I did the pastoral... Jesus follower thing as I'm driving. I said, you stupid idiot. <laughs> it's a direct quote. That's Raka. And my son reminded me. He said, you stupid idiot. And it, right, I mean, the Lord uses him like all the time. Because I thought, how can I? I'm like, I'm like, I just literally, I just left thinking about this and how important it is not to do that. And, uh, you know, so I was like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. That's been me. I've been the guy, I mean, anyone here ever not pay attention and do something drive where you're going, oh, wow, I'm really glad the Lord protected me because I should be dead right now, <laughs> Right? Yeah, if you didn't raise your hand, I know you're not telling the truth, or you don't drive. <laughs> right? And uh, so, yeah, so I had like this little holy moment of praying, and uh, I don't want to give the devil a foothold in any way. And Jesus is calling us. He's saying, look, this isn't about just the law. This is about allowing, allowing your heart to be changed and transformed where you understand the spirit of what I'm giving you, the promise of what is here. These people around you have been made and given life. They're made in the image of God. He says, don't call someone a fool. To say, to, to, to say raka, there are things that we say to people that, that, it, that makes us insult their, that we, we call out their intelligence, right? But to call them a fool is to show contempt for their character. Jesus says, don't do that. They're made in the image of God. Oh, there have been those times in my world, in my life, when I found myself in a place where I really had contempt for someone, believing that God will never get a hold of them. It's a dark place to be, isn't it? And we think somehow if I hold this, this against them and I have this, this, and I refuse to let go of this memory that, that's caused whatever, the bitterness or anger, whatever in my life, that I need to hang on to that when God calls me to value them and to love them. And this is what I know today in the current climate. It's easy to lose sight of what our calling and mission really is as a follower of Christ. I'm called to be salt and light, and so are you. You see, people come to see Jesus because the Holy Spirit draws them. People are attracted to Jesus because they see the Holy Spirit at work in you, not because you can beat them in an argument. I've been on social media a little bit lately. There are a lot of Christians that think, if I can just prove my point here, I'm going to change the world. No, you're not. You could be right as rain. But God draws people when the Holy Spirit is seen evident in your life. Friends, there are ways we can share things on there that elevate who Jesus is and what it means to love him and what it means to love others. And let's pray about that, right? 
There are ways we can respond to people in our community, in our neighbors, in our family. And those questions I asked you, there are ways that you can respond to your loved ones, even if you love them with everything. There are ways that you can respond that will elevate them and move them closer to Christ. We need to pray about that. People come to Jesus because the Holy Spirit draws them, and he calls you and I to be salt and light. He calls you and I to bring out those God qualities in every way. We are called to speak the truth in love. And I need to remember that. And I'm reminded of this. This is, this is a fact. People who carry hurt and pain will offend you and they will hurt you. Hurting people hurt people. Why do we push back sometimes insult for insult? Why do I find myself sometimes when I'm hurt, I push back and I hurt back? Because there's hurt and pain in my life too. And there's hurt and pain in your life. So Jesus says, when you pray and you remember your brother, you remember your sister, go to them and pray. In, in Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 12, if you want to turn there in your Bible, I invite you to do that. If you want to write it down in your notes that you decided to take early on in the message, you can write it down. But go to Romans chapter 12 and go down to verse, oh, let's go to verse uh, 17 of chapter 12. And in, in that Romans 12, 17, we find this. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. You know when you go to people, sometimes you won't be received. We're not released from loving them. But as much as it depends on you, you seek to, to love them. You seek to reconcile, to make things as right as can be. It says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. There are things that, are, that is for God to do. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Later on in this message, Jesus says to love your enemies. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, in doing this you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not help your enemy thinking that they're going to have burning coals put on their head. I've seen people think that way. I'm going to help them because they're going to get it. No, you, you help them because you love them, because you see them as God's creation. And if there's judgment to happen, God will take care of that. If they harden their heart, the Holy Spirit will not force his way into your life or into the life of whom you're witnessing to. We need to remember that. You're going to pray for people. You're going to love people. And there will be people that you pray and intercede for, and you will see that, they, that not all of them will come to Christ in your lifetime. That doesn't release us from loving people. Over the course of the past, I think it's been like three or four years now, I've adopted this approach. Before I talk to another, I always try to pray for them first. There are times where I, where I seek to, where, where, where I just want to react and respond, and, I, and I'm reminded, you need to pray for them before you even talk to them. So I pray for them, and sometimes God has me pray for quite a while before I approach them. And as I pray, I consider and pray for what they are currently walking through. As I pray, I try to understand what their position is. What's their perspective? What are they dealing with in their life that I may not be aware of? And if I don't know, when I talk to them, I try to, I try, I'm trying to learn to listen more and listen first. It 
So Jesus is talking about this whole way as he's speaking to his, his apostles and the disciples and those that are there. He's saying, look, I want your heart to be changed. I want you to walk in this relationship with me that is, that is different and fresh and understanding that I'm helping you. I want your life to be so changed that, it's changed, that it changes how you see others. So I encourage you this week, spend some time in, the, in these passages and read them. And then Jesus says this, and I want to go to Matthew chapter 7 now and, and, um, and read that with, together with you. Matthew 7, go to verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fail. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. These words we, we read are brought to us with the authority of God. When Jesus is the rock of your life, it's a sure and a solid foundation. It is immovable. And I can tell you, the greatest of storms do not change that. So a couple weeks ago, two Sundays ago now, we were coming back from our family road trip. You can put the picture back up if you want, if you can. And uh, it's about a seven hour drive back. And we were tired. And um, you know when you're tired, that last hour, everybody gets a bit punchy, right? <laughs> so we're, we're coming back. And... Um, Jesse and I, Jesse was riding shotgun and Caleb and Lindsay were in the back and, and I can see them in the mirror and I hear Lindsay say, who, my daughter-in-law is nuts by the way, <laughs> and that's okay in a good way. She says, hey Caleb, we need to, we need to make sure your dad's not sad. Let's sing Disney duets. <laughs> so, um. So they decide they're going to have van karaoke. Caleb pulls out his phone, and I, I see him in the mirror. He's holding this phone up, and they start singing somewhere out there. And it was terrible. <laughs> and, and then one duet led to another duet. Uh, I heard, we heard, it started off with just Disney. Then I heard all these, I heard, I heard Sonny and Cher, you know. <laughs> I got you, babe. And they, and, it was there, and they were just hamming it all up, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm just watching them, and I'm just, I'm, I'm di and we're dying laughing. I mean, there are tears rolling down my face, and I'm just dying laughing. And uh, this went on for like the whole last hour of our trip. And I'm watching them, and I thought a couple things. First of all, I looked in the mirror, and I said, said to myself, uh, I'm so glad they love each other. And I looked at her, I said, I'm so glad I can see her looking at him with love. And uh, more importantly, I'm so glad they love the Lord. And then I thought this, with God there's always more. And this next chapter is okay. God's doing big things. Church, God's doing big things, but he calls us to keep him as the foundation. He calls us to be, young, to be young people, to be men and women who stay on mission. I'm called to be salt and light in this world. I'm called to allow my relationship with him to change how I relate with other people. That means we're not going to be, we're not going to shy away when, when there's tension or trouble. We're going to seek the love in the midst of that. 
We're not going to be perfect, but we're going to seek to follow Jesus who is, and who will help us, so when we, when we do fall, we will, make, we will make sure that we go to Christ right away. When I find myself in a position where I devalue another, that I don't allow that to get a foothold in my life. Right? That's what it's about. So I'm going to pray, and then, uh, and then as we leave, I want to do this. If you want to stay and pray, stay and pray. And after people who leave, um, if you want to come up here and pray, I'll pray with you if you're comfortable doing that. If you need to pray, but you're not comfortable being up in the close, Pastor Steve's going to be outside, and you can pray with him. Um, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. And uh, as we leave, uh, we go leave from the back to the front, right? See, I'm still technically on leave, so I have to make sure I get all this right. <laughs> let's pray together. Father, you're a good God. You've met us today. Lord, I thank you for... Uh, this day where we're reminded of how important it is to, uh, to honor uh, the family. We have this day called Father's Day where we're reminded that of how important it is uh, to embrace the leadership and to pick up a mantle that says, I will serve the Lord and I will, and I will live in my house in a way that honors the Lord. Father, I, I pray that the dads who are here would be encouraged. The dads who hear this message would be encouraged at knowing that you call them uh, to follow you and to serve you and to lead in a way that would honor you. And that they would know that, that even if they've messed some things up, you're faithful. You're able to, to, to forgive. You're able to walk with them. And you're able to help them experience your presence even now. Father, you gave us hard words in your, in your scripture. But also, Lord, you've reminded us that we don't do these things under our own power. We do these things submitted to your will and your Holy Spirit working in us. So, Lord, help us this day. Help us to focus this week. Lord, help us to consider this week uh, how we define our relationship with you, with others. Lord, help us to consider how others may see or perceive us. And Lord, I pray that as we spend time with, with you, that we would find that you are shaping us. Lord, I praise you for this day, and we give you the glory now. In Jesus' name, amen.